What is up everybody? We are going to jump right into this one. I've had these spalted maple slabs taking up space in the shop forever and we are going to finally use them up. So this one I kind of just flopped it on the ground and it broke in half and I kind of like that look. So I ended up trying to break another one in half here. I actually got these off of Facebook and they weren't milled or dried properly so they're just kind of all twisty and cracky which was another reason I wanted to break them in half just because it would be easier to get the piece flat along with trying to get it to fit in the radius I wanted it to fit in. So now that we kind of talked about it for a while and got a design we liked, we just broke them down into smaller chunks just so I could kind of get a better idea of how twisted and warped these pieces actually were. So jigsaw to the rescue just to break them down into more manageable chunks. And then I just took them over to a more flat, reliable surface and just kind of figured out which sides were more flat. And then I just shimmed them and then we just ran these through the drum sander a bunch of times until I had them relatively flat. They didn't really need to be perfect as we we're going to be covering these things in epoxy and flattening them again once it's all cured and whatnot. And now that our two slab chunks are relatively flat, it's time to make the mold for the slabs and epoxy. So I just busted out the bandsaw jig and just made a quick circle. I made it an inch bigger than I wanted it, so I had a little extra room to work when we finally cut it out. But now we're just going to trace this onto the slabs themselves just to ensure they'll fit in the mold nice and snug. And this is just a cheap piece of melamine I got from, I think it was Menards. And then to bust out the old trusty jigsaw. Again, accuracy doesn't really matter. As long as it fits in the mold pretty good, I don't really care how clean this edge is because it's gonna be cut out with a router jig later anyway. And since I am no epoxy pro, I've been watching a bunch of Blacktail Studios over here on YouTube and he is a pro when it comes to this stuff and he used this Vertigo garden edging landscape stuff. So I gave it a try. I think it was 20, 30 bucks for this giant roll. And I just cut it to size and then I probably should have figured out a better way to join them together, as you'll see later. But I just kind of taped the heck out of it and uh, hope for the best. And when it comes to epoxy, that's typically not the best idea. Then we just ran a thick old bead of caulk and then smoothed it out, and hopefully this would help seal it up a lot more. Um, this is just literally some caulk I had laying around, and we shared this entire process to Instagram, so go check us out there for daily posts. But I'll probably try something different later. I was recommended to use 100% latex, and again, I just had this stuff laying around, so I just used that up. And then once that caulk dried, I just got some cheap mold release off of Amazon. I think it was like $12 a can. I can link that in the description, and I just sprayed it on and then wiped it off. And then I just did as much as I could to help seal this thing up and just followed it around with more Tyvek tape on the bottom. And then we just went ahead and prepped these slabs, just removing any of the gunk off the sides or any loose materials as you don't really want any of that floating around in the epoxy or anything affecting your bond from the wood to the epoxy. And then another big issue with working with wood like this is spalted maple is essentially rotting wood. So we did everything we could to kind of harden this up and make sure it stayed intact and just didn't turn to mush. So we used this penetrating epoxy to seal it up and hopefully harden up a little bit of that punky wood. It's also super important when you're using dyes and stuff as that punky wood will absorb so much and if you're using like a dye or a pigment, it'll bleed really bad and not look very good. So you seal it up to give it a nice even uniform look along with hardening up that soft stuff. And again, I am not an epoxy expert, as you'll see very soon here. I just have a PhD in YouTube and kind of just figure all this stuff out. And uh, here we are using the heat gun of shame. So pretty much any time you mess up with epoxy, it's typically because you didn't mix it well enough or your ratios were off. And here, I'm pretty sure my ratios are off. It, it was over a day and it didn't harden, so I just said, heck with it, and scraped it all off, wiped it down with some denatured alcohol, and then just put another coat on it and we were back off to the races. I mean, if I was gonna mess up, I would rather it be here than pouring hundreds of dollars of epoxy. So lesson learned, take your time and mix your stuff properly. And then a few days later, I just kind of scuffed everything up to make sure I'd get a good bond with the epoxy when I poured it. So I just used this wire brush to get everywhere I could. And then that was pretty much it. Give it a nice scuff to ensure good adhesion. And then now it's time to mix all the epoxy. Now is when you really need to be super careful. I really like to use stopwatches just to keep me honest on my times, but with this Deep Pour X, it's great because the setup time is so slow, so I didn't I didn't feel rushed like you typically do with the faster curing epoxies. So just make sure you mix this super good, getting all the sides, and relatively keep track about how much black or whatever color you use so that if you have to mix more, it'll at least match and doesn't look all weird and layered. So we just started pouring it in here. I let the epoxy sit in the bucket for like 15-20 minutes to release some of those bubbles 
And then we just took our time and slowly poured more in until it kind of topped off. And then another tip from Blacktail Studios was he uses a brush or his finger or whatever to rub the edges where the epoxy meets the wood. That just helps from bubbles building up there and it really ended up helping a lot because if you've poured epoxy before you get those little micro bubbles and they're quite annoying to fill. And then after it sat for a little while I took a torch just to pop some more of them bubbles. And don't go crazy here. This epoxy is a slow cure so it takes forever to sit up so just let it sit for like 30 minutes and then just kind of pop some of the bubbles. But don't go too crazy because you can actually burn the epoxies and that does not look good and a lot of them will just kind of naturally pop themselves as it starts to cure. And after about an hour of babysitting it, this is just kind of how we left it. Had a couple fans blowing and, and these deep pour epoxies take forever to set up so don't be alarmed if it's not jelly yet in a few hours. Okay. So, 98% of it's still in there. Right here is where it leaked, where it connected these together. Um, again, I have no idea what I'm doing, but so I just kind of added tape to it and you can see it starting to seep around here and then I just uh, taped it up just with this Tyvek tape and there's the damage. So no big deal. Um, it actually just all came from this area. So if I make another one of these, I'm going to have to figure a better solution out for this, but overall it went great. It's finally starting to get like, it's like, like it, it doesn't move anymore. I'm afraid to touch it, but yeah, I didn't mix quite enough. So I'm going to pour a little bit on here along with filling the cracks and then I'm going to plane off a little bit. So overall first epoxy pour, I think I did good. Now to just top this off, um, I stopped relying on these little jugs and just got one of these little scales cheap off of Amazon. And this made me feel a lot better than just mixing it and messing something up. So I just went ahead and topped this off with this Moss Epoxy's flag and then I just used relatively the same amount of black dye. I don't like the pigment, I prefer the black dye, it's just the look I like, but just remember to try to keep track so if you have to layer it, it's not all weird looking. And now that the most nerve wracking part was done and I didn't have a floor full of epoxy, it's time to see if our mold release worked. Again, these were cheap cans off of Amazon, so I was a little concerned that it wouldn't, but I also did go a little overboard with the mold release, but I guess better safe than sorry. And this edge banding or garden edging came off super easy. And here you can see it kind of had some sort of weird discoloration or whatever, but I think that's just from the excessive amount of mold release that I used. And then we just slowly worked our way around the mold to try to get as much off. I think the caulk held it on more than the actually epoxy. So we just kept tapping our way right around and it eventually just popped out. It probably took us like 20 minutes, but we didn't want to break it. So we just took our time. And also note to self, epoxy can be quite sharp when coming out of the mold. So just be careful and or wear gloves. So now to actually cut this thing out into a perfect circle. I just went ahead and used this circle jig from Rockler. It worked pretty good. Just drilled a small hole in the center and then just made sure my measurements were correct. And then I just used a quarter inch down cut bit to do a single pass with the router jig. I only chose to do a single pass because I've heard of people having issues with it drifting or cutting too deep or whatever. So I just did one single pass about a quarter inch deep and then I just followed that up with the jigsaw. And of course I had to see how strong the epoxy actually was. Where it just broke there was all wood. And now we might as well jump on it to see if it'll hold my weight. And it actually did. It was quite strong and impressive for just this. This I think cured for about two weeks before I actually got to this part. And now to make it nice and clean, we're gonna use this giant half inch flush trim router bit, which works amazing. So same thing here, just kind of working my way around following the clean edge I cut with the router. And yes, I should have wore a mask. I was just in the zone and it totally blanked my mind and I recommend you wear one when working with epoxy as this stuff's kinda nasty. Then I just cleaned up any chatter marsh unevenness and then we just slapped this thing into infinity to get it nice and flat. It was actually pretty flat out of the mold but I had to shim it a tiny bit and I just actually used some construction paper and that was plenty. And this worked amazing. I think it took like 12 to 15 minutes per side, but my back thanked me later. 
As you can see, it's pretty flat. I still had a little bit of a low spot, but that's no big deal. This will just be the bottom. And now all we need is a base. So I'm hopping out to the other garage where I have all my metalworking gear. And we're just going to use this cold cut saw to chop all this into more manageable chunks. So it's a little easier to work with. So I designed this in SketchUp to get all my measurements and angles correct. And then I just made that into a piece of wood to check everything. And then I just use this piece of wood as a template. The only thing that's different is I changed the length on some things to make sure it fits. I went ahead and prepped all my joints with just a 60 grit flap disc to clean up these pieces a little bit, just to ensure I got a nice clean weld. Then I slowly worked my way around checking for a square to make sure everything was good, and then I just do a couple tacks all the way around and continue to ensure it's square since the, the heat of the weld will actually pull it out of square. So just double check everything and then start laying some welds. And this is a little sneak peek at the welds. Unfortunately, these will be ground off because I'm going for a nice, smooth, clean look. And then I'll just grind these off and then do the same exact thing on the bottom. Again, I just like running these flap discs. These are Benchmarks Abrasive. I will have a link to these in the, in the description if you're interested. And now that we have our bottom part of the base done, I'm going to go ahead and tack everything together to get the basic shape. And again, check everything for square. I actually tacked one of these up and it pulled it way more than I expected, so I actually broke one off and had to re-clean up the joint. Then I just worked my way around the piece, laying down some welds. Make sure you just don't weld one joint solid. Hop around and let that heat dissipate a little bit, otherwise you'll run into some problems. Now I just gotta add some caps for an attachment method, and I will offer plans for this if you're interested in welding. You probably could even make this out of wood, but it'll be mostly for welding. Just, it'll be a cut list with the angles and the measurements for all the pieces. And then I just work my way around with a 60 grit flap disc to clean everything up and just knock everything down. And now for a test fit. I should have angled the legs out a little more so it was a little closer to the edge as Jess recommended, but I said no, it'll be fine. But it ended up still looking pretty good. And here's a sneak peek at it. We're still gonna add a profile to the edge of the wood, but overall I'm pretty happy with how it turned out. Whenever I can, I like to add adjustable feet to furniture because your piece may not be perfect and floors and homes are definitely not always perfect. So no one likes wobbly furniture. So I just busted out this rivet nut tool that I got off Amazon and I think it was like 60 bucks, but it works amazing for simple leveling feet on furniture or metal bases like this. And the next time you see this thing, it'll have a nice clean coat of paint on it. And then we added, wanted to add a nice steep chamfer to the bottom of it, just to give it a little more shape and character so it's just not a round chunk of wood. And this was a pretty big bit, and it was a cheap bit, so I didn't want a bunch of burning, so I ended up doing, I think, three passes. It ended up turning out pretty good. I'm really glad I added the chamfer. I might have added a little bit steeper of a chamfer if I could, but that's all right. It turned out just fine. And as I'm recording this voiceover, Jess yelled at me from the kitchen saying that I should have just listened to my wife. But I didn't, and that's just how it works. Now just to clean it up, I used the sander just to clean up all them swirl marks from the CNC along with any burner marks or chatter marks from the router bits. And I just spray painted this with self etching primer and then some black paint and it seats on there perfect, nice and flat and now we just need to add some finish to this piece. And the finish of choice is Odie's Oil. The reason I went with Odie's is because Odie's recommends sanding to a high grit and you kind of got to sand the epoxy to a higher grit just to make it look not all swirly and scratchy. So that's the reason I went with Odie's. I probably will try Osmo or something in the future, but this turned out pretty dang good. And this spalted maple sucked up a ton of it. Now that the paint is cured several days, I can take out these screws that I put in the rivet nuts. I just put these in there as a temporary fix to keep it off of the surface just so that the feed wouldn't get full of any finish or anything like that. So now just to put these in there for their final look. And of course we gotta get one more final sneak peek before we assemble this thing. And oof, it turned out good. Look at that beautiful spalted maple and all that character in there. It turned out lovely. The final step is to attach the base. Usually my go-to method and stuff like this is just threaded inserts as they are nice and easy to use and they hold on pretty tight. 
So I'm just marking all the holes with this self-centering bit to make sure everything lines up perfectly. And then I always like to use a collar. It makes me feel better than tape. Tape sketches me out. Because the last thing I want to do at this point is plow a bit through the top of my beautiful piece. And then better safe than sorry, I just add a little bit of CA glue to help hold these guys in. And that is it guys, stick around for some finishing shots of this beautiful piece. This was our biggest epoxy pour yet and it was for the builder's challenge. The theme was something round. So it gave me a great opportunity to use up some of these slabs and uh, make a cool piece out of epoxy. It was definitely exciting. Let me know what you guys thought about this video. Make sure you follow us along on Instagram. We post there almost daily. Hope you all have a wonderful day.